Motorman has been hounding me for months to come tell you about the CX-90 plug-in hybrid. I've been working on secret stuff I can't tell them about, so it took until Christmas break before I could do it. But here we are, I'm gonna talk about the how and why we built the CX-90 plug-in hybrid. You'll recall the inline six version had under the hood an inline six, amazingly. Uh, the plug-in hybrid has the inline four, which is actually the same basically the same 2.5 liter, super high compression, naturally aspirated Skyactiv G engine that we have in a CX-50 or a CX-30, uh, just turned 90 degrees uh, and shoved really far back in the engine bay. You'll notice this huge gap between the radiator and the engine. This really reminds me of my old first gen RX-7 I had in 83, uh, that you'd open the hood and they're just, you could like stand in front of the engine. And this is, you know, this is sort of just Mazda heritage. We're so uh, into the vehicle dynamics and really want the, the, the center, center of gravity as far back as possible, want the mass really centralized, so we pull the powertrain back as far as we can. Um, but what's going on here that's different than the inline six, you'll recall that car had uh, six cylinders and then a small electric motor for a mild hybrid system that could stop the engine and restart it and do a little bit of torque fill uh, to sort of fill in for turbo lag and that kind of thing. Um, and then it had the planetary gear eight-speed transmission where we are using wet clutches instead of a torque converter. Getting rid of the torque converter makes room for that, that electric motor. So that's how that whole system works. Um, the plug-in hybrid, on very simply, we just make that motor a lot bigger and make the engine a lot smaller so, so that we can do more with the motor and less with the engine. Now, this confuses people a little bit because it's pretty unusual for a hybrid system to run an electric motor driving through a conventional transmission. You're used to electric cars typically will just have a direct drive electric motor with one gear. And people tend to think that electric motors have just sort of this infinite torque uh, and, a, and no power band at all. They just make the same power everywhere. That's not quite true. They make their peak torque at zero RPM, so they're great for launching. But then as the speed goes up, the, the torque potential of the motor drops. Uh, and so in order to make enough torque to still accelerate when you're on the freeway, uh, you end up needing either a transmission or a really big motor. If you're just building an electric car, it turns out it's almost always easier just to put in a bigger motor and have one gear than it is to have a smaller motor and a two or three speed transmission. Porsche and Audi are the exception. They put a two speed transmission in a slightly smaller motor. Works out fine for them. But this is a different situation where we already have a transmission because we have an engine that has to drive the wheels. Uh, and if we already have an engine, <laughs> if we already have a transmission, um, then we're better off driving the motor through that transmission. We can use a smaller motor uh, and use that low RPM torque in every one of the gears. The torque, the, the power band of the motor is closer to that of an engine. Uh, there's another reason why we want to use both the engine and the motor driving through the transmission. Uh, it's because it gives us a consistent uh, performance on the, on the car. That doesn't make any sense. Let me explain how the transmission affects the steering and handling of the car. Um, we are using the all-wheel drive system to really fine-tune the way the car handles, uh, especially in terms of the yaw damping of the chassis. When you are turning into a corner, um, as you go through a corner, the wheels need to turn slightly different speeds. And as we connect or disconnect the front rear wheels through our all-wheel drive control, uh, we are making them want to go the same speed when they're connected or making them free to go different speeds when they're disconnected. This creates a, a damping of the yaw motion of the car when we engage the all-wheel drive system. So even when you're nowhere near the grip limit of the tires, you don't need the all-wheel drive system for traction. We are manipulating the all-wheel drive system to fine tune the yaw damping and the, the, the handling motion of the car. Uh, and by driving always through the same powertrain and through the same all-wheel drive system, we have a consistent feeling uh, from the steering and handling. If we were to, for example, drive the rear wheels with the engine and the front wheels with the electric motor, which is a possibility but would be kind of awkward, there are, there are plenty of hybrids out there that, that do this, where they'll drive the front wheels with an engine and the rear wheels with electric motor. Uh, but then you have these different dynamics when it's rear drive and front drive and, and the, the, you can't really control uh, the, the detailed steering response of the car. This lets us get a very consistent driving feel uh, between the plug-in hybrid and the inline six from a steering and handling viewpoint. Now from a powertrain viewpoint, that's gonna depend on which driving mode you're in. Now the basic idea behind a plug-in hybrid is you should have enough electric drive torque 
to get from home to work completely on electric motor, get from work back to home completely on the electric motor, and just use the engine when you're driving longer than your regular commute. Now, if you live in Montana, you don't have a regular commute like that, you should probably get the inline six. Um, but if you do have a mind-numbing, drudging commute through traffic, uh, we can leave the engine off entirely and just drive with the electric motor. This gives you lots of different options of, of how to do it. Normally, if you charge the battery at home uh, and you start driving, it will automatically use the best mix of engine and motor for how you're driving. And it actually shows you on the, the dash, uh, there's a power meter that shows you how much power you're putting out and what the limit is of the electric motor at that time with the amount of battery charge you have. And you can try to actively stay out of the engine or you can just drive it normally and it'll turn on the engine whenever it needs to and turn it off when it, when it doesn't need it. But if you're trying to do your commute completely on the motor, you can switch the drive mode into EV mode and then it'll let you use all the way down to the, the bottom of the pedal will just stay on the electric motor. And only if you go into the kick down switch, you definitely need some power for some emergency situation. Then it'll turn on the engine and just, just go. Um, but that gives you the flexibility to do, this is rated at 25 or 26, I forget, miles uh, on the electric motor. In the real world, you'll typically get better than that because you're using this for commute and commute traffic is slow and EVs are more efficient when you're driving slowly. So I often go over 30 miles on just the electric motor. All right, so, so far we've been talking about commuting and you know, driving on just the electric motor. But the thing is, we've got about half the power on the motor and about half the power in the engine. And if you wanna drive fast and you go deeper in the throttle, it'll give you both at the same time, it'll be pretty fast. But what happens when the battery dies, right? Then do you lose half your power? It turns out that actually when we say the battery's dead, it's not really dead. We leave enough charge in the battery that then it can operate as a conventional hybrid. So it has power in there to give you a boost of power when you're accelerating. And then when you're cruising, you'll just cruise uh, on the engine. The only time the battery really will deplete to the point where it can't help you is if you're going up a long, long mountain where it's using both uh, powertrains at the same time. And eventually when the, the battery gets low enough that it can't help out with the motor, then it'll just downshift because we got eight gears uh, and the reds will go up. Uh, and I've done obviously plenty of twisty mountain road driving because that's what I do in these cars. Um, I've chased GTRs up the mountains in this thing after the battery's depleted. The handling uh, is remarkably good uh, when you get out in the places where we like to play. Uh, but the only real difference in the performance up there uh, is once the battery's depleted, you're just at higher revs. Uh, you don't really notice a big loss of power when the battery's dead. So Motorman did a review of this car. Uh, he said he didn't like it. He did a review of the i6. He said he did like it. So what that tells me is he's one of those Montana guys who likes the open road. Uh, and if you live in some place that's just all open road, the i6 is probably the one for you. If you live in some place where gas is expensive and electricity is cheap and you have to commute, uh, and you want to drive uh, without having to burn gas most of the time, uh, this is definitely the one for you. Uh, I think in, in my, if, if I needed six more seats than I actually do, this is probably the one I'd be driving because I do have to commute uh, and drive in the city. So there you go, pick the one that works for you. Uh, you can go in the comments and tell Motorman why he's wrong. I always like to see that. Um, or you know, maybe you're from Montana, maybe you want the i6, that's fine. I just found out something really interesting. Apparently, there is a channel on, you, on uh, Motorman's thing of just me talking about cars. Um, if you wanna suffer through more of that, then you should go click on that. He'll go put a link here somewhere and you can, you can do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, do the socials and all the stuff that he tells you to do. I don't understand any of this stuff. Talk to you later, bye.